It's an ongoing debate and a source of frustration for parents and kids alike. How much screen time is too much screen time? Well, despite the vocal concerns adults have about negative influences on their connected kids, data suggests there are many benefits and opportunities. But how do we ensure all young learners have access to technology? Dr. Mimi Ito is a professor in residence at the University of California, Irvine. She is a cultural anthropologist of technology use with a focus on the relationships children and youth have with new media. Dr. Ito, thank you so much for taking some time from your busy schedule. My pleasure. You've done a tremendous amount of research in this area. How far back does cultural and parental anxiety go in relation to young people, their interests, their interests rather, and what they spend their time on? Yeah, so certainly uh, parental and grown-up concern about what kids are doing with media and their interests in technologies predates digital technology by many, many years, decades. Uh, in fact, ever since, you know, media like the printing press and radio and television came about, there's always been, with every generation, um, concern about the new kinds of cultural expression and also the new sort of... Um, media, whether it's print or digital or electronic media. So uh, today's concerns about social media, digital media, you know, um, they really reflect sort of an ongoing uh, tension between grown-ups and kids. Well, there appear to be some big misconceptions or stereotypes potentially around youth and technology. What are some of those? Yeah, I think the biggest stereotype I see out there is that all kids just innately love technology and they use it in similar ways. So there's sort of this words that get thrown out like the digital generation or uh, kids these days as if um, every kid is really attached to technology and they often get described as a generation as sort of the iPhone generation or the digital generation. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, kids' use of technology is just as diverse as grown-ups' use of technology. And there's probably more diversity in how kids are using technology than there is similarity in a lot of ways. And it's commonsensical, but we often find ourselves talking as if teenagers are all the same in how they use or uh, are attracted to technology. And then the other big mis misconception and stereotype out there is that Technology, um, you know, sort of the volume of use or the uses of technology, as you said in your opening, that they're overwhelmingly negative and that it's leading to addiction and narcissism and, you know, social anxiety and, uh, you know, inability to write or to connect to others. So there's this litany of sort of negatives that um, is as if the technology is driving all these negatives, when in fact, uh, the research is really clear that things like anxiety, depression, you know, social problems, violence, that these are overwhelmingly driven by problems in the world that we know are sources of stress, whether it's uh, poverty, uh, whether it's, um, you know, stressors in the home, instability, you know, problems with friends. Uh, these are all things that we know are the underlying drivers of young people running into emotional or social problems. And technology is a medium for possibly amplifying or trans, you know, communicating some of these issues, but they are not in and of itself the driver of things like anxiety, depression, or addiction. But what you're saying is if there's a vulnerability pre-existing, that vulnerability is going to transcend to new media. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we find that um, online and offline vulnerabilities mirror each other. You know, that's the one of the big findings that we um, and some of my colleagues like Candace Odgers has done an uh, incredible review of the research literature that it's really the things we know about what stress gets out in real life are also what stress them out online. It's not exactly surprising, but we're looking for the scary causes in this new thing like um, social media. Um, and then the reverse is also true, the positives also mirror each other. So when kids are very connected to their families, for example, uh, technology tends to be something that families come together around rather than something that pulls them apart. Same with friendships, same with interests, learning, everything that we want to be a positive in kids' life, uh, technology can amplify that as well. Well, what are some of the other benefits that we're seeing of a younger generation and a fluency in technology? 
Yeah, so I think one of the things that we really saw during the pandemic is that young people's ability to foster caring social relationships, to hang out with each other through technology was a real source of resilience for young people when they were cut off from their uh, real life ties. Uh, so, you know, because young people don't have as much freedom as grownups do to like go out and hang out in places and they're even in their homes, they don't often have control over space the way their parents do. So young people by necessity have used text messaging or games as a place to connect with their friends. And during the pandemic, um, especially, you know, kids who were, you know, frequent online gamers or who were very connected with each other through social media, there was sort of a natural fluency to adapting uh, their social relations online. And in fact, you know, the research has been coming out on how gaming has been real, a real source of social support and resilience for young people. Uh, whereas grownups, we had to struggle to figure out how to do our, you know, Zoom happy hours and other things that we weren't accustomed to doing um, because we just didn't have that same fluency. And I think historically, you know, I've been studying uh, teenage use of technology for decades now, whether it was, you know, text messaging or social media or these new gaming communities that we're seeing popping up. Uh, you know, what the grown up world benefits from young people innovating and testing and trying things out because they're at a phase in their life where, you know, this is what they're growing up with and they're in an experimental phase. So we benefit from these social innovations that young people have uh, really put forward for us. Well, there is much in the news about political action to limit access to certain social apps. How serious is that for young people? Well, I feel like, you know, at, having watched young people move from Facebook to Instagram to Snapchat to TikTok, I feel like young people will always find ways of using technology and platforms to do the things they want to do online. I think the impact, though, is going to be really serious for people, whether it's young people or adults, who are really looking to those platforms to, you know, help with their livelihood or become influencers or using it for purposes that, you know, sustain um, their business. These are things that are going to have tremendous ramifications. And we're in an era when, you know, those cultural um, effects are, you know, quite profound and will affect young people as well um, beyond just whether they're able to hang out with their friends. Well, you've said that technology can level the playing field or raise barriers to opportunity. How great is the divide between privileged and non-privileged children and youth? And how is technology impacting that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in contrast to all of the concerns about, say, depression or addiction, what is less commented on, although I'm seeing more of it because of the pandemic, is how technology can really exacerbate the equity gap. Uh, you know, we see this in part because technology, people are always wanting the latest and greatest. And so suddenly, if you're able to stream videos or you're able to use um, an app on your phone, then suddenly that becomes the currency, whether it's for social engagement or for schools. So what happens now in the context of a pandemic when you're a young person who doesn't have their own phone with an unlimited data plan and schools are relying on streaming video or Zoom or things Things that require not just simple text messaging, which most kids have access to, but we found, um, you know, that they're, they're, as we move to uh, smartphones and broadband access, that suddenly the baseline is so much higher now for what it means to be fully connected. And that gap between young people who have their own computer, you know, a, a high bandwidth connection, the ability to, you know, have sort of that unlimited access to online and those that don't. Now, not only does it affect their educational opportunities, but it also affects their ability to stay in touch and have those basic social and emotional needs met, um, especially during the pandemic. So I think that's a huge concern. If everybody was still relying on just simple text messaging, the divide wouldn't be as broad. But now you have you know, multiplayer, fully 3D online games, virtual reality, streaming video, all of these things that, you know, are creating really um, amazing uh, educational and social and creative opportunities for privileged kids, but the gap is just getting wider. And I think that's a big concern. And unless, 
grownups start looking at the digital as a space of, you know, positive um, engagement, not just in school, but in the fun side of things, as opposed to something that we should be limiting, nobody is going to take that equity gap seriously. And I think it's really important that we recognize that kids' access to those social and fun uh, aspects of digital life are just as important as their access to the academics. Well, as you've indicated, parents and educators can be much more creative and actually help kids use digital media in pursuit of shared life goals rather than engaging in battles over screen time. Dr. Ito, an important perspective. Thanks for sharing your expertise on this issue with Newspoint. Thanks so much. It was great talking to you.